the way. Welcome again, everyone. Thank you for joining us um, at our webinar today, how OSF Healthcare is leveraging data to scale chronic disease management. <clears throat> My name is Tracy Baker, and I lead the clinical operations and implementation team at Current Health, a Best Buy Health company. Current Health is the platform that supports the OSF on-call advanced care program. And we're joined today by Beth Wharton, who leads the OSF on-call advanced care program. I'm going to give a very quick overview of Current Health as we're all joining and settling in, and then I'll fully introduce Beth in a moment. All right, so about Current Health. So we seek to enable care at home for everyone everywhere. We do this by enriching and saving lives through technology and meaningful connection with our customers and the patients that they serve. As I mentioned, we're a part of Best Buy Health. Sometimes when we say this, it turns a head or raises an eyebrow. But one of the biggest challenges in scaling care at home is that final mile to get into the home. It's the logistics, it's the supply chain, it's getting support out into the home to help that patient or consumer. Half of our population don't have home internet and a fifth don't have smartphones. Yet those are the populations that our customers want to, to reach most. That's where they feel they can have the most impact. So Best Buy Health is, you know, Best Buy is world-class in logistics and in-home support. We have 20,000 Geek Squad agents in every local community and 70,000 of Americans, 70% 70 of Americans live within 15 minutes of a Best Buy. So this is where we think our superpower is to help healthcare providers scale their care at home program. The majority of our work is with health systems and hospitals. We aim to be their single, single, single partner to deliver all care that they want to outside of the brick and mortar and the walls of their health system. So regardless of if it's a patient uh, in an acute hospital at home program, at a, in a post-acute early discharge pro program, or a patient living with multiple chronic conditions, we seek to provide all of the technology and services that enable that across the continuum. When I talk about all of the services, I really mean we provide the logistics, supply chain, all of the technical support, clinical support, and all of the knowledge to deploy this type of care model. Our implementation and customer success teams combined have 450 years of healthcare, digital health, and project management experience. Many of our partners are just embarking on their sort of first care at home journey, so we bring that knowledge and expertise to the table to help them develop clinical pathways and operational workflow design. We bring all of it together in one solution, one platform, so that we can provide care at home to all of the populations that our customers choose to, regardless of medical conditions, socioeconomic drivers, and whether or not they have in-home connectivity. So now that we're all settled in, um, I'm going to uh, fully introduce Beth and get to the heart of the programming. So we're happy to have Beth Wharton with us today. Beth is the operations manager of the OSF on-call advanced care program. She has been a nurse for over 25 years, 17 of those years at OSF, and she has been in a leadership role for 15 years and four and a half years in digital care. As I mentioned before, Current Health Platform supports Beth and her team to manage the advanced care program for hundreds of patients living in our home state of Illinois, uh, a program they stood up pre-COVID before this care model was really in vogue with health systems. So Beth is gonna to talk today about how her program uses data to improve outcomes in delivering chronic care management at scale. I've personally had a front row seat to the exceptional care her team delivers. I wanna say personally, we visited OSF last year and we talk a lot in this industry about clinician burnout. It's real, it's less real at OSF, no doubt due to Beth's leadership and culture she drives there. So with that, Beth, the virtual stage is yours. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Tracy, for that. We've appreciated working with you as well. All right. So just wanted to start out a little bit, just kind of giving a shout out to OSF On Call. So um, On Call is the entity that OSF has dedicated 
um, to digital platforms and really trying to um, build programs that reach our patients when and where they are, um, when they need it, um, care when they need it, and then where they are at at their most convenience. So um, OSF On Call is always available. Um, we're providing that digital care platform um, that really helps um, patients and caregivers to navigate that health and wellness journey wherever they're at. So this is just a brief little overview of like where we're at here in the state of Illinois as, as Tracy referenced. And so um, as you can see there, our on-call entity is located central in Peoria where our headquarters are located. And then we branch out to there um, with our on-call connect uh, locations, our urgent cares, and then you can see our, our hospital locations there as well. So pretty much central to upper state um, with one uh, being down towards the St. Louis area in Alton, Illinois. So within On Call, just to give you a little background of kind of where we're at today in digital health here at OSF, we have three pillars um, within this entity um, that make up digital experience, digital care, and on-demand. So if you kind of think of each one of these digital experiences, kind of that entry point for patients when they contact us or reach out to us, um, things such as non-clinical um, uh, scheduling, central scheduling, um, as well as when a patient enters the system, if they're reaching out to be set up with a PCP. So really kind of at that entry point of when they're reaching out to us as a system. Then our digital care uh, pillar encompasses our you know, digital platforms, our digital tools that we use. So programs that we've set up like EICU or our digital hospital, um, our outpatient and community service programs, so our low, medium, and high touch programs for chronic disease monitoring and community-based care. And then our on-demand pillar, which would um, involve our urgent cares. So want to deep dive now into advanced care, which is one of the programs within the digital care pillar um, of On Call. And just to give you a little bit of background about um, why we're here and then a little bit about the evolution of where we're where we've been and where we're at today. And so on on uh, advanced care is really providing that digital remote patient monitoring program really is helping to coordinate care that connects our highest risk patients to the right resources when and where they need it hopefully to you know, better those outcomes and improve that patient experience. So a little bit about where we've been. Um, we um, implemented this program in August of 2019. Um, so we went live, um, you know, just kind of did a small ramp up uh, to get us started. And then um, we landed at about 60 patients where in March of 2020, a little thing called COVID hit all of our worlds and just really kind of um, you know, shook us and really we had to reset to how we think about how we're treating our patients and what we're doing in our programs. During that time, we stood up, you know, several COVID programs, uh, digital remote monitoring um, programs for COVID. So we paused um, the actual OSF advanced care uh, program as far as enrollments. We continue to care for the patients that we had in the program at the time, which was very beneficial to those patients. They felt like that they were still connected to care. Um, being at high risk, um, they appreciated the fact that they had somebody to reach out to. They didn't have to go into a facility uh, to be seen necessarily. They could reach out to us with immediate needs. So, um, that then, as we moved forward after about six or eight months, we started enrolling patients again um, in a slow way as we were still dealing with COVID. Um, but we started to relook at our inclusion criteria and how we um, how we enrolled patients into the program. And so it evolved into more of a focus on um, proactive chronic disease management rather than just getting those patients that um, were at their sickest level um, or potential highest um, level for needing care. And I'll explain a little bit more about that here in a few minutes. In 2022, we, um, we uh, were uh, really honored to work with the state of Illinois um, and received a contract with the state to provide our services for the, uh, the Medicaid population, excuse me. Um, Medi Medicaid Innovation Collaborative um, was what that was referred to. And so we were able to extend these services and this high-risk um, high remote patient monitoring to that payer population. 
And then in 2023, we're currently sitting um, around 400 patients, give or take, and uh, continuing to grow the program and look to see how we can um, advance this program in different ways. So remote patient monitoring um, through our program. Uh, so we're using, again, that digital application. Um, remote patient monitoring really provides chronic disease management support 24-7, 365. Um, it's with patients that have multiple chronic conditions, as you can see here, uh, COPD, diabetes, heart failure, and hypertension. Um, some patients may be enrolled for one of these, but most of our patients have at least two or more. And this is just a quick little um, example of, you know, really looking at those high risk patients. So using an, um, an advanced analytics model to really identify these patients. And then our team reaches out to patients for potential enrollment in the program, explaining to them what the program per can provide for them and then getting their consent to enroll. And then the patients receive that kit from Current Health. Um, our uh, digital health navigators um, help to deliver that piece of equipment into the home and be an at the elbow set up and support. And then we use that tech platform um, that triggers alerts in real time for us to be able to acknowledge and to intervene as needed. So we monitor that dashboard and follow um, you know, operating procedures, triage guidelines um, to care for patients in that digital world. Um, and then we provide routine visits. So we have routine scheduled uh, nurse visits, provider visits, pharmacy, um, behavioral health consults, dietary consults, and we'll talk more a little bit about the team here in a minute as well. So leveraging current health um, for that care at home platform. So this technology dashboard really helps to drive how we outreach to patients as far as priority in our daily care with patients. So when we're getting those out of range or abnormal symptom alerts, um, those are generating those alarms to our team so that we can acknowledge those quickly. Um, and then patients are categorized in that dashboard, like you see here, if they have um, a critical alert, they're gonna fall to the top of the list for us to address. And then more um, medium level alerts that may be just out of range, um, just a quick, um, something's going on there we need to address, and then that would fall into that medium category of prioritization. And then leveraging current healthcare um, at home platform. So, um, you know, we're able to do a lot of different things through this platform that really help us to engage with our patients. So we're able to do that complete remote assessment um, through the platform and reinforce condition specific plan of care. So seeing what the alarms are that's coming through, being able to look at the trends and, and um, the day to day um, status of a patient has really helped us be able to know what we need to focus on for a plan of care with that patient. Um, we're able to do education with teach back. Um, we triage as needed based on those alerts, like I mentioned before, coming through. We can act on those quickly. And then we can also refer to the appropriate level or venue of care if needed. So this is all powered by our interdisciplinary team. And so we have 24-7 um, coverage by um, nursing and clinical staff. Um, we also has a nurse, nurse navigator on our team that functions as that conduit um, with the offices through their care managers. Um, we recently added a dietitian role, which has been a huge, um, a huge benefit for us and our patients um, for resource and education. Um, and e-pharmacy, um, uh, pharmacist is embedded uh, within the program. They do complete med recs um, upon enrollment and do a thorough med evaluation and assessment and then make their recommendations to the team. They also do follow-up visits with the patient when they've had any new meds or changes in medications. Um, so that's been uh, very beneficial as well. Um, routine provider visits by our APRNs, uh, they're also available 24 second 24-7, 365 for access to a provider. We also have our clinical counselor um, 
uh, for behavioral health needs, which has been extremely beneficial to this patient population. And then, as I mentioned, with our digital health care navigators, um, really being that boots on the ground for our equipment and set up with this equipment, um, the patients, um, you know, may not be feeling well. And it's always helpful to have somebody demonstrate how to use the equipment and get them um, on the right foot um, right out the gate with their enrollment. So um, that has been a huge addition for um, our patients that has proved very, um, very beneficial. And then we all do this through the current health monitoring platform, um, which um, has been um, our source of data um, uh, reporting. And then just to kind of mention the supporting teams that come out of this that are behind the scenes is just the IT, the analytics, um, our tech support, and our scheduling staff as well all work to serve this patient population. So some lessons learned about integrating data into care management. Um, so, you know, where is data driven program success with this? And so really truly when we're looking at um, the, you know, using that high risk scoring to best, you know, find the best fit for this program has been crucial. So um, I'll talk a little bit about that and how um, we've used data analytics to help us with that. But then really leveraging that real-time RPM data, like I spoke about getting those alerts and being able to drive that clinical intervention um, is truly um, so beneficial and important for these patients. Then using that data interoperability to power downstream clinical um, value. So really how can we help um, manage that chronic disease um, and keep that patient from having to maybe have an ED visit or a readmission because we were able to intervene quicker. Um, and then also measuring care program, return on investment to drive future investment. So how can we take this program and expand it to serve entities within our own organization by partnering with them and even looking beyond our own walls and um, partnering with other organizations to provide this service. So using risk scoring to identify, um, you know, that best fit um, patient for our program. So just talking a little bit about where we were at and where we've been and then looking into the future. And so today, um, or excuse me, um, when we first started, we were looking at a specific payer population that was really truly focused on our managed care plans. We um, identified that as probably a, a great place to start for cost utilization, um, cost reduction, cost savings, um, and looking at the top 5% of that payer population as being our highest risk uh, patients. And so we were truly focused on reducing ED visits, reducing hospital readmissions, and trying to help manage those patients um, alongside the PCP office and the specialist so that we could help reduce that high cost um, service. Where we're at today, so we evolved into, after we came through COVID, we started really reevaluating the program and how we enrolled, how we identified patients for enrollment in the program. And so we really worked with our analytics team here at OSF um, to uh, build a predictive analytics model. So basically what we did was we took every patient within the system and assigned them a risk score based on um, different data points and criteria from without the um, from within the EHR. And so we were really looking at, you know, anything from diagnoses to medications to problem lists to, um, you know, frequency of ED visits, um, hospitalizations, even utilization of outpatient services. And then that calculation gave that patient a risk score. And then that's where we kind of threw a dart at the wall and said, hey, where do we need to, you know, cut those off as far as what we need to look at. And so we kind of did a, a review of, of those highest risk patients or that top um, percentage of patients that we were seeing fall into some of those highest scores and then decided to move from there as far as enrollment. And so looking into the future, then how can we take those scores? How can we take that risk score for any patient in our system and help align them to different programs throughout um, on call? And that is either a low touch program that might be within community services or SDOH um, needs and, and connecting the patient there, 
or is that a medium touch program that might be a little less touch than the advanced care program with our highest risk patients and connecting the patients with those types of programs um, to help um, monitor and connect them to care. So really looking at that real-time RPM data to help us you know, drive that clinical intervention, which we've talked about a little bit. So I wanted to give you a, a little example. This is Mary. Um, she's an 82 year old that was enrolled um, in our program for congestive heart failure and hypertension. And she's had a history of frequent ED visits and exacerbations over the past year. And that's why she fell to our, um, to our um, uh, high risk score and um, our outreach uh, component. So this is just an example of the CHF pathway. We have different clinical pathways set up for each one of these disease diagnoses. Um, these are all really based off of the gold standards um, for each one of these disease, chronic diseases. And so this just shows the kit configuration where you can see um, we've supplied Mary with uh, a BP cuff, a scale, a pulse ox, and a thermometer. Um, she also gets a tablet with that that she um, that is Bluetooth with these pieces. Um, to uh, download that data. And so you can see where a scale would be really important to Mary with her CHF to you know, look at those um, weight increases. And so you can see um, that those readings would come through daily. Um, she would also complete a wellness survey every day to kind of let us know where she's at for that day. Um, and then also filling out patient satisfaction survey. Um, these are the alarms that are set for this type of patient. So these would be the, the ranges. And then there would be um, alerts that would be built out um, based on out of range or critical alerts um, that would flow over to our team. So this is just a quick view of real-time patient data um, and alarms that's coming through on our dashboard. So um, we're able to see um, on that graph there, um, you know, what that looks like each time that the patient puts their vitals in. So we can easily see what a trend is looking like for that patient. Um, and then there's configurable alarming that happens, and you'll see that in the um, number three up there where it shows that um, weight gain, um, we can instant video that patient or we can chat with that patient through the messaging and, you know, check in with them or give them a call um, if they're not utilizing one of those services. We can get in touch with them quickly to find out, you know, what has changed with that patient for the day. And so we also have the capability of individualizing patient alarms. And so the importance of this is um, being able to really um, individualize what, where the patient lives um, day to day. So we may have somebody that, you know, continually lives in a low diastolic um, blood pressure um, area. And so we're able to change that slightly based on provider direction um, so that it reduces the amount of alarms that are coming through. We know that this is standard. We know by the trends that we're seeing that this is where the patient lives. And so then we're able to avoid fatigue and alarming and really make this quality for the patient as well as the care team. And then going beyond that biometric data, really looking at, again, like I mentioned, the patient surveys, really get an idea of where they're at for the day. Are they having increased shortness of breath? Um, are they struggling with day-to-day -day activities? Uh, those kinds of things. And so then it really prompts those regular check-ins. We can chat them and say, you know, we've noticed that you answered higher on this question today. You know, do you need a call from our team? What can we do for you? Or we can directly outreach um, either via a video conference or a phone call. So using that interoperability to power that downstream clinical value, like I mentioned. So this EHR integration support um, is bi bi-directional, which has been great. Um, so immediately when we identify that a patient um, you know, wants to be in our program, we're able to put in that order in Epic, which immediately kicks off um, the enrollment process with Current Health. And um, that patient demographic data and information is then sent directly automatically to Current Health. There's no manual entry with um, that um, registration or entry into the Current Health platform. 
And then as the patient begins to um, put in their vitals or put in that information and we're receiving that data, that comes back in a flow integration from Current Health back into Epic. And so we're getting those vitals um, flowing into a flow sheet within Epic, which has been very um, crucial to in really opening up um, uh, a visual to anybody that would get into this patient's chart, maybe their specialist or um, another provider that would be caring for this patient, they can see what's been going on with that patient while they've been enrolled in our program. This also could be very helpful um, if a patient is out of state, maybe they're on vacation, maybe they're a snowbird, and they visit um, a healthcare facility somewhere else that maybe has Epic eLink and can access that information um, as well and see what's been going on in that program. So um, very beneficial to have that um, bi-directional support. Measuring uh, care program return on investment to drive that future investment, like we mentioned before. Um, so what we're measuring, um, so we're looking at several different things when it comes to patient health. Um, right now, we're looking at alarm frequency um, so that we can potentially individualize that to a patient's need, um, which really is beneficial in that sense. Um, we're in progress of looking at chronic condition metrics. Again, as I mentioned, uh, we started out as a cost savings, cost reduction. So we, um, over the last few years, have really been and we've also been looking at readmissions and ED visits and what that looked like for the patient prior to enrollment versus post enrollment. Then we're looking at patient experience, of course, wanting to get patients feedback on would they recommend this program to someone else and then support calls. What does that look like? The volume of, of time and interaction that we're spending with a patient um, based on this high risk um, criteria. And then utilization, we're looking at length of stay in the program, um, adherence and engagement um, are, are crucial to um, the success of a patient in this program. So really looking at those things as well, as well as the financial benefit, like I mentioned, the overall spend, the hospitalizations and readmissions. All right, so just wanted to show you a few things that we are um, currently looking at here. Um, I'm actually gonna start on the right-hand side. So we're looking at that average readmission rate. Um, this is done in an index scoring. Um, so it's the percentage rate up at the top is the percentage overall of our patients for readmissions in the program. But when you look down um, in the data below, it's in an index form. So what that's doing is it's looking at a patient comparing themselves to what they were previously. So not pooling the entire population together and comparing them to say a cohort, but really looking at that patient prior to enrollment versus what they look like after enrollment. And we're doing that at a beyond ramp up phase, which is 90 days. And so anything above considered um, area of improvement or some, you know, some opportunity that we might have anything below a one would be we're doing well, we're on the right track. And so you can see that split out by the fiscal year, but we can also drill down into each quarter. We can drill down even into the patient level to see, you know, maybe we can identify that it's a patient and look back to do quality reviews to say, was there something that we could have done to intervene with that patient? And so the call out I have here is in quarter two of this year, um, which was January, February, March. In February, for our census of, a census of around 350 patients, we had zero readmissions for that month. And that's really what has helped to drive um, that index down. And we're continuing to see that downward trend. So we're really excited about that and um, has been really some big wins. When you think about where we've been with the program, um, there are some critical points there with growth over a couple of those years, and then you include COVID into the one and the, prog uh, the program pause there for a while helped kind of add to some of those different numbers or variations in numbers. We've had a 95.7% patients would recommend this program to others, so we're really excited about that. Glad that patients feel like it's quality. And then also looking at that spend index. So again, the same thing, comparing a patient prior to the program to after enrollment and really seeing that, hey, we have, you know, even though we have had readmissions and we've had ED visits with these patients, we've been able to reduce the overall spend um, on these patients. So um, huge call out there um, with that data. So what's next? 
So just kind of in summary, um, you know, you've kind of gotten a history of where we've been, where we're at, and these are some of the things that we're looking at within on-call. Um, we're looking to um, expand modern OB services to include, um, you know, not only um, OB pregnant moms, but to um, postpartum as well. And how we can do that, that's in our outpatient, um, one of our other outpatient programs. Also looking at digital primary care and how we can strengthen and, and support that uh, digital service more. For us specifically in advanced care, we're looking at that enhanced home care. And so we're partnering right now with home care in a pilot project to provide our same remote patient monitoring services um, for high risk patients post discharge. So really identifying those patients in the hospital, they have a high risk for readmission and how can we um, support home care with remote patient monitoring and our interdisciplinary team uh, to help monitor those patients for 30 days post discharge. And I believe that's it. I think we're open for questions. Thanks, Beth. Um, just a quick reminder to the audience members, you can submit any questions via um, what should be a little box before, below the video screen. So uh, Beth, it's kind of funny. You actually answered one question about uh, does your program work with home care team in the home and include any home care in home care. So that's perfect. Um, the next question that we have is, have you incorporated any kiosks in the community to deliver on-demand care? If so, what's your experience been? If not, are you considering it? I can speak a little bit to that. That's not really in my realm, but I know a little bit about what's been going on with um, some of the other programs within On Call. And I know we have set up like um, tech bars. So we have gone into several of our entities and set up these digital um, uh, areas where we can connect with people while they're there um, in that in that office or in that hospital and we can help get them connected to these programs and possibly enroll them based on what's going on or we can refer them into these programs um, so i don't know that we're providing direct care through those types of kiosks but um, we are getting them connected uh, to the to the programs that we offer for sure Perfect. Thanks, Beth. And the next question is around the uh, vital signs in the in the readings. Do patients manually enter the reading? That's a great question. So um, all of the peripheral devices that we use are Bluetooth equipment. So um, I all but the thermometer, I believe, is not Bluetooth. Um, we don't regularly take um, uh, temperature readings on our patients just if they're symptomatic. Um, so that one's not as big um, as a you know an effort for the patient. But the the um, the Bluetooth capability has been crucial, um, made it very easy and simple for patients because that data then immediately downloads through the tablet into our dashboard. Next question, have you had any traction of use in federally qualified health centers? If so, which ones? I love that question. So yes, so with our Medicaid contract with the state of Illinois, that was something that was spelled out um, in that contract that we um, work with all four of our uh, federally qualified healthcare centers. Um, so we have Heartland Healthcare in our area, um, Chestnut, um, I believe Aunt Martha's and the other ones is Eagle View. Um, so we're enrolling patients from each of those programs into our um, advanced care and working with those providers. So that has been uh, really broadening our scope of care in this program. And we have really enjoyed working with those entities to pro provide care for those patients as well. Perfect. Um on that note, can you just remind us of the proportion of patients in the program who are on Medicaid? Oh, boy. Um, General ballpark. I want to say it's uh, probably about 50 50 percent right now um, because we have been focused on those Medicaid enrollments and expanding that due to the contract that we've had. So I would say it's it's about half and half. Perfect. Um, what is one piece of advice you'd give someone trying to build a program similar to advanced care? Oh, that's, that's a really great question. Um, 
You know, I think lessons learned, we we had the, the initial gut feeling that an interdisciplinary team to provide this care was very important for this level of patient um, risk um, when it comes to that chronic disease management. And we, we have found that time and time again that that has been very much the case um, and has been vital to how we provide care for those patients. And then that constant communication with those providers in the offices, really trying to put together what this patient looks like on a day-to-day -day basis for these patients so that when they show up in their office, they have an idea and a picture of what's been going on since the last six months that they've, you know, when they saw them last. Um, I'd say when you're looking at building a program like this or, or starting one, really getting that um, support from senior leaders and support across your organization, really getting the buy-in of other providers and um, doing your research on what, what you can provide, um, what you can offer, that's huge. Because I think when you really help them see what it is that you're able to do um, for them and to help them, um, it really will, will help you in the long run as you, um, you know, start to, you know, continue to build that program out after implementation. But having our leadership support was huge, um, very much supportive of these programs and what we can do to help really reach our patients in every area. Thanks. To reach the info, do you also use cellular enabled blood pressure monitors for blood pressure RPM also? And Tracy, I don't know, you might be able to answer that one. That's something that we don't currently use within our program. I don't know if you have other um, organizations that do. Yeah, yeah, we definitely have. Wait, did I just cut out, Beth? I'm so sorry. No, I sound good. Okay. Yeah, so we we have the the uh, Bluetooth enabled blood pressure cuff for uh, lots of our customers that use it. All right. Um, let me make sure I didn't miss any questions. Anything else? We'll pause for just one minute here. These have been great questions. Love it. <laughs> Okay. All right. I think we'll wrap up. We'll give everyone a few minutes back in their day. Beth, thank you so much. Thank you so much to everyone who attended. Um, we really appreciate the time that you spent learning about the OSF on-call advanced care program. And thanks again to Beth. Yeah. Thank you, Tracy. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day.